uh, here is uh, the keep. Ah. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, nobody can introduce him better than our dean of the library. Well, in the continuation here of the, the Symposium on Ancient Greece, we're honored to have with us the um, Institutional Repository Librarian here at Booth Library, who is uh, in charge of the efforts uh, for the keep uh, uh, for Eastern Illinois University. Uh, today, he's talking with a different hat, and that is that of his background in technology. And um, we're anxiously awaiting some comments and uh, information from Todd Bruns. Thank you, Dr. Lyon. Okay, um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I don't know if we're running on continuous video or not, um, so hopefully they'll understand this comment, but I don't know if I can really um, follow up on aphrodisiacs. But um, <laughs> hopefully um, you will find this presentation interesting uh, anyway. I'm going to talk about ancient Greek technology. And uh, this is a wide area, so I'm going to focus on particular inventions and uh, talk about a couple of different inventors. And I'm going to kind of set the stage a little bit. Uh, again, I'm following up on uh, Kathy's presentation, which was uh, fantastic. So I am going to um, start out with a prayer. Um, and the prayer is this. This is from the Homeric Hymns. It's a prayer to the god Hephaestus. That's the picture over on the right. Hephaestus was the Greek god of craftsmanship and technology. And uh, this was a prayer that um, craftsmen would say. It's basically talking about how technology has, they felt, the Greeks felt that technology has lifted them up. As they say here, uh, we used to dwell in, in caves like wild beasts. Now we've learned the crafts from Hephaestus. Uh, it's making our life good. I also want to start out with um, sort of setting the stage here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we think about the ancient Greeks and their technology. And when I get into the who's who, we'll discuss uh, two or three of the inventors. And then the individual inventions I'll be talking about are listed here. The one at the bottom, analog computer, is the one I will focus the most on because this is just an amazing invention. Uh, if we had not discovered it, uh, people probably would not believe that they actually could have done this type of technology. So it'll be very... Um, I hope interesting to get into discussing that. So through ancient lenses, here on the left we have our ancestors, Cro-Magnon Man, about 35,000 years ago. On the right we have today's modern man looking very contemplative. And I'm bringing this up because uh, when I was taking a, a course called Global Technology, it was talk, taught by a certain uh, Dr. Wafiq Wabi. And <laughs> And that's when I first met Dr. Wabi, and we read a very interesting article by Jared Diamond called The Great Leap Forward. And Jared Diamond talked about how 35,000 years ago, our larynxes changed so that we could have complex speech. And people started living longer. Those two things made a big difference in terms of all of a sudden, we started doing art, we started doing technology, we really did this great leap forward. This is important thinking about the ancient Greeks because I think we tend to think about previous generations, previous societies were not quite as smart as we are. They didn't quite have the technology we did. Actually, they were. 35,000 years ago, if this man had had the cumulative technology, he could have built a 747. They were as smart as we are. What they lacked was the cumulative technology. That basically, you can't build an atomic bomb until you've had gunpowder. So these people were smart, and the ancient Greeks were smart, and in fact, they had an industrial revolution that for them rivaled our own industrial revolution. This picture is from an arena uh, in uh, Apodavros that sat 14,000 spectators. And you can see that there's a person standing in the center of the arena. If you drop a coin on that floor, you can hear it all the way in the back row. That's how good their acoustics were. So they just, they had fantastic architecture. Um, they really went through this great flowering of technology. And they refer to this as um, techni. Uh, there's going to be an upcoming presentation by uh, Dr. Hawkins. He's going to talk about this in more detail. Techni means in Greek craftsmanship, technology. They related it to art because in both cases they were creating something out of nothing. So techni was a very important part of ancient Greek society. So who's who? There's three ancient Greeks I'm going to talk about. Hero of Alexandria, um, and he lived uh, approximately from 10 to 70 in the Common Era. A lot of the inventions I'm going to talk about came from Hero. 
he was a professor at the museum in Alexandria, which was uh, the Library of Alexandria was part of that. Um, he built some of his um, inventions were based upon previous work done by Tisibius, who lived about 300 years earlier. He was probably the first head of the museum at the, uh, Alexandria. Uh, we don't know much about Tisibius um, in terms of his personal life. We know a lot about his inventions. Uh, the one thing we do know is he was very poor. Everyone who wrote about him talked about how poor he was. Um, the third person is Archimedes. Archimedes was a Renaissance man before the Renaissance. He was a mathematician, an astronomer, an inventor. He was all over the place. Uh, he was about the same time period as Tisibius. Uh, he lived in uh, the Greek colony of Syracuse. And he is probably the person who created the analog computer that I'm going to talk about later. So starting out with the different inventions. This one is the steam engine. Uh, this was by Hero of Alexandria in the first century of the Common Era. Uh, in terms of complexity, it's the first use of steam for power. But the interesting thing about it is it wasn't used to, to really drive any kind of practical use. It was, for, it was used as a temple wonder. Uh, a lot of the, the inventions that Hero came up with were things that were in the temple where people would come in and see this thing moving and think, oh my goodness. Now that was very important to the Greeks, but uh, we sort of look at it and think, well, why didn't you just create a steam engine out of it? But, um, but this is what it looks like. Um, and in fact, it's so important that even today in the US Navy, you get badges for being a specialist in certain things. If you're a specialist in uh, boiler technology on a ship, you have a badge that has a semblance of this, which is called the e EO pile. So it's very interesting. Um, another technology uh, invention is the, vent the first vending machine came from the ancient Greeks. Um, this was also a hero of Alexandria. And the way that this worked was, uh, this vessel was filled with holy water. You dropped a coin up here, it hit this lever here, the lever went down, the spigot came up, and the holy water came out. As the lever drops, the coin falls off, the spigot stops, the holy water stops. And uh, so in terms of complexity, it's, uh, it's so complex that our own vending machines, before we had electricity, used this same type of setup. So that's how advanced they were. And I thought it was interesting that the reason why um, Hero invented this was people were taking too much holy water. Uh, <laughs> so they had to come up with a way to say, you know, if you put more coins in, that's fine, you're paying for it. Alarm clocks is another invention. Um, I think we think our modern day, you know, we are rush, rush, rush. We have all kinds of appointments to be at. Well, the ancient Greeks did as well. And they actually had alarm clocks. This one in particular is what's known as uh, Plato's alarm clock. Um, we think this might have been uh, an invention of Tisibius's. Uh, what it does is it uses air pressure to move water from one vessel to the next. So you start out with your water up here. There's a little hole at the bottom of this vessel that drips at a constant rate into this vessel. Once the water reaches a certain point, it falls into this third vessel in a rush, filling up, pushing the air out. The air comes out this little hole here, which is a whistle. And that's how your alarm goes off. Uh, once you, and so you get up and you take the little plug out of this vessel, all the water drains out into the bottom one, which you use to fill up the top. And that's how that alarm clock works. They had other um, alarm clocks that uh, had to do with water and pebbles, where it would, it would drop pebbles on gongs. Um, this one is called uh, Clepsidrus, which uh, literally means water thief. Showers, you know, we think of uh, showers are a, a really important part of our daily lives, and uh, they were for the ancient Greeks as well. This is from a vase, and this depicts uh, female athletes that are taking showers after some games. Their showers were so advanced that they wouldn't have been out of place in one of our bathrooms, except for the fact that the spigots were shaped like animal heads and the water came out of the animal's mouth. But um, they used lead pipes to deliver the water. There was a drain in the floor that then also with lead pipes took the water away. So again, very advanced. Um, this, um, I couldn't find who invented this. There didn't seem to be anybody that was listed. Uh, in terms of complexity, again, it's not unlike our own modern shower system. And uh, at Pergamum, which is a Greek city-state in Turkey, um, they, they found a whole gymnasium full of these. So these were not uncommon. And I mentioned Pergamum in particular because that's going to come up when I talk about the analog computer. This is an automatic door. 
This was created by Hero of Alexandria. Uh, you would light the fire, you would heat up water that would move this weight, pull these pulleys, and the temple doors would open automatically. Uh, now this is interesting in terms of complexity. It uh, utilizes the physical principles of pneumatics, um, but the question is, um, we don't really know if this was actually ever produced. Uh, we see drawings of it, but there's been no archeological evidence that they actually did this. And now the analog computer, the, the big one. Uh, this is uh, probably from Archimedes of Syracuse. In terms of complexity, it rivals our technology today. It's that advanced. And as I get into the story, I, I think you'll see why. And it demonstrates an incredible levi a level of understanding of the physical universe. And again, I'll explain how that is. So I'm going to start out telling a story. Um, it was a dark and stormy night. And uh, it literally was a dark and stormy night. 2,000 years ago, a very large Roman galley trade ship that was taking Greek treasures back to Rome sank in a storm off the island of, of Antikythera. And 2,000 years later, in 1901, another storm off the island of Antikythera stranded some sponge divers. And the sponge divers thought, well, as long as we're stopped here, we might as well go down and see what's on the seafloor. So they went and did some diving. And they started seeing um, like statues. They started seeing bronze statues, marble statues, and they found the crashed galley. Um, the galley probably uh, came from Pergamon because they found coins from that city-state. And Greek trade, or sorry, Roman trade ships were very, very big. They can only fit in certain harbors. So this one, Pergamon could take a, a ship like that. Costs and roads down below um, could take a ship like that. So most certainly that's where it was coming from. It was heading back towards Rome. And here's where Antikythera is, just right off of the southern part of the Greek peninsula. And that's where it crashed, and that's where they found it. And amongst the pieces was this corroded bronze piece. Now, when you look at it, you automatically know this is something different. Um, you can see it's machined metal. You can see that there are places for spokes and gears, and there's this wheel. And they could make out that there are some teeth in the wheel. So they automatically knew this is something new. But it's, it's all one piece. It's all corroded together. So what, what is it, and what was it for? They, they didn't really know. So the first investigation happens in the 1950s with uh, this is English physicist Derek Price, and he did radiographs of this piece. And what he determined was there are at least 27 different gears in this machine. And he also started counting the teeth of the gears to try to figure out what it was for. Now, for the Greeks, astronomy is very much like mathematics, and they're doing a lot of counting here. And these two numbers stood out. Two of the gears had, one gear had 235 teeth on it, another one had 127. These are core numbers that are related to the moon. Now, the way they're related to the moon is this. Uh, the moon goes around the Earth in 27, well, sorry. Yes, the moon goes around the, the Earth in 27 days. And you can tell that because you will see where the moon is in the sky compared to a star. When it goes around the sky, it comes back to the same star, 27 days. The moon goes from a new moon to another new moon in 29 days. So when the Greeks are counting on their calendar, they're thinking, OK, a moon month is 29 days. Well, as we all know, that does not add up to a calendar year. It's 354 days versus 365. But it does add up to 19 calendar years. That's what the Greeks called the metatonic calendar. And that's where those two numbers come from, because 235 moon months are 19 solar years. The other number, 127, is the, the, the number 27 days times 19 years, which is 254. Divide that in half, you have 127. And then they used a small gear to move that. So, those, so Dr. Price figured out these two gears are mapping where the moon is in the sky. OK, so what difference does that make? Well, in our modern day, we see the moon up in the sky and we think, that's pretty. For the ancient Greeks, it meant everything. It determined whether they went to war. It determined whether they had a festival. Uh, it determined something like if you were going to travel at night. You needed to know, is it going to be a new moon or a full moon? Because I need that light. So it was really important to them. The only thing was that uh, he could not figure out what some of the other gears were. There was a very large gear on the back of the machine that he thought had 222, 223 gears, uh, teeth on it. Dr. Uh, Tony Freeth, and this is around the uh, 2000, 2001,
he led a team to further investigate this piece to say, what else does this thing do? And he went to a company in England called Tech, Ray, X, Tech X-Ray. They do three-dimensional um, images and three-dimensional x-rays of items. So they created an eight-ton machine that they had to take to Greece to the museum because this piece is too fragile to move, deliver it there, and run this, uh, this piece through their x-ray machine. And what I have here is rotating images that they took. Now, if you see this in real time, it kind of floats in and out. It's really ghostly. But as you can see, as we're going through, you, they started discovering new gears that were buried in that lump. They started seeing new posts that were there. Um, it really started revealing a lot more of what was in this mechanism. And uh, it's just the level of complexity is, in, is amazing. So they could figure out, OK, we have all these other gears. They're counting all the teeth. And they're thinking, how can we figure out what this is all about? And they ended up making a computer model of all the different gears to try to ferret this out. This is a picture of the back of the machine. And you look at the complexity here. This is a very large gear, 222, 223 teeth. This is the front of it. And there is the gear with 127 teeth on it. And so they also needed, so they, so they could see the interior, they can see all the gears, but they also needed to see, can anybody see any Greek letters here? It's a little hard to read, but they, they saw there's little millimeter type print all over this machine that's been chiseled into the machine in Greek. And they thought if we can read this and understand it, that'll give us a better idea of what's going on here. And so they went to Hewitt Packard, who has a way of looking at paintings they take a big, giant dome that's got flash bulbs on the inside of it. This is a picture of the outside of it. And what it does is it flashes light from different angles, on and off. And so you start being able to see the paintings. It shows you where the brush strokes are and how the painting was put together. And they thought, why don't we try this with this piece and see if it can reveal the lettering. And this is what came out. So the letters just jumped out. And they started being able to read the Greek and see what the instructions were. So what the meanings were, were the back gear, the very large gear, they saw it said 223. So they knew it had 223 teeth. And they started thinking, well, OK, so what is that all about? A chance discovery uh, led them to realize the Babylonians uh, back you know, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years had been watching the sky and been, and been predicting eclipses. And they kept all these clay records of when the eclipse would happen. And actually, it was really interesting. What they would do is, they, if they knew an eclipse was coming up, the king would step down for the day of the eclipse. They would put some poor guy uh, up in that, you know, your temporary king for the day. Uh, at the end of the day, they would say, OK, all the bad omens from the eclipse, they're all on you now. And they would kill him. And then the regular king would reassume his throne. So in a way, they, they yeah, bad omens, yeah, the guy's going to die. So they, it was true. So, <laughs> so this is called the Saros cycle. 223 uh, is the Saros cycle. And they started realizing that what this machine does is not only monitors where the moon is going to be at, it actually predicts eclipses. So it's a time machine, in a way, because it is predicting when an eclipse is going to come up decades in the future. It also predicts whether, this is the Greek letter sigma for the moon, helios for the sun, uh, and this is uh, aura, which means is shorthand for Greek for hour. So what this means is it's predicting eclipses. It's predicting whether it's a lunar or solar eclipse. It's predicting the hour. And there's even lettering on the machine that indicates what color the lunar eclipse is going to be, which is telling whether it's black or whether it's blood red, which tells you the direction of the lunar eclipse. So we start seeing how complex this machine is. Predicting eclipses, predicting whether it's solar, lunar, predicting the color of the lunar eclipse. And it gets even more interesting. We know, and the Greeks knew, that the moon's orbit is elliptical. It moves faster when it's closer to the sun, moves a little bit slower when it's farther away. Amazingly, this machine accounts for that. This gear has a pin and slot device that allows for variable movement, that accounts for the movement of the orbit. Not only does it do that, and there's a picture of it sitting on top of the large gear, 
It also accounts for the fact that the, the elliptical orbit of the moon rotates around the Earth every nine years. It accounts for that. So here are all our prime numbers that the, that the Greeks were working with. The 19 years, uh, the 127, 223 years, 53 years is related to this variable movement. And so they start realizing, wow, this, this thing does all these things. It's, a, it's really an amazing piece. And so they started thinking about, well, who built it? They looked at the Greek lettering, and they knew that Greek city-states um, have particular names for months. And the months that they saw on the device were Corinthian. So they know, OK, this is coming from a Corinth or a, a colony of Corinth. And they also saw these are words for Greek uh, Panhellenic, Panhellenic games. This is Olympia for the Olympics, Isomia. Isomia happened in Corinth. And they saw that it's higher than Olympia. It's in bigger letters. So that was another clue that this is Corinthian. And why did they have the Panhellenic Games on the device? Is because the Panhellenic Games happened every four years no matter what. It didn't matter whether city-states rose or fell. It didn't matter if kings died. They had the games. That's how you set the device. That was the fixed date that set the device. This writing here in orange um, is talking about the movement of the planets. So the device actually also had it monitored each of the planets here. So you had the Earth in the center. These are all the planets moving around the device. This kind of blurry black ball here was the phases of the moon. It was black on one side, white on the other. So as it moved around, it that moved, and it told you what phase the moon was in. OK, so really complex machine. Where did it go? Um, why did it disappear for you know, hundred, you know, thousands of years, and we just discovered it? Well, the, where it went was east, basically. Uh, the Greek world collapsed as Italy was rising as the Roman power. Uh, and that's what happened at the time it was taken, was the uh, Roman galleys, big trade ships were moving through the Greek uh, world, taking Greek treasures back to Rome. Eventually, Rome collapsed, and that knowledge tended to move east to the Byzantine Empire first, and then eventually to the Arab world. And that's where this technology went. This picture is the second oldest gear that has ever been discovered. This is from 500 in the Common Era, and it came from Lebanon. So the oldest one is the Antikythera device. This one is the second oldest. That's a clue that this technology went east. Uh, also, we have found drawings such as this uh, from the Arab world. Again, this is that gear technology. Now, eventually, gear technology came back to Europe. Uh, via Spain, via the Arabs. In the 14th century in Europe, all of a sudden, there's this explosion of gear technology where people start making clocks left and right. And so it did eventually come back to Europe and just bloomed there. So to wrap up, um, this is a picture of the device. It sat in a wooden box. And it's basically, it's how the Greeks understood their world. It predicted the, where the moon was going to be. It de depicted the phases of the moon solar and lunar eclipses, the movement of the planets. Um, it, it was really of a piece of how they understood the universe. And I wanted to read a quote uh, from Dr. Price, where he says, quote, it's a bit frightening to know that just before the fall of their great civilization, the ancient Greeks had come so close to our own age, not only in their thought, but also in their scientific technology. And I want to leave us for my final thought with a bit of serendipity. If it hadn't been for two storms, one 2,000 years ago, one you know, in 1901, this device wouldn't have been at the bottom of the sea. It wouldn't have been discovered. And if somebody had just created this and said to us, I think the ancient Greeks did this, we probably would never have believed it. So it's an amazing serendipity that that happened and we discovered it. And it tells us something about um, what the ancient Greeks were capable of doing. So I want to thank you for your time. I hope you found this informative. Um, Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> any, any questions? Any questions? I have a question regarding uh, it's one of a kind that they found. They didn't find uh, any replicas or more than one. They haven't found them, but there are stories of them. Um, in Syracuse, um, the Romans sacked the city. In, uh, they sacked Syracuse. And uh, General Marcellus gave the order, do not kill Archimedes. We want him. He's brilliant. Don't kill him. 
Uh, this, the way the story goes was a Roman soldier told this old man who, this old man was drawing circles in the sand and told him, you need to get over here with the other captives. The old man said no, and he ran him through with the sword, and that was Archimedes. Uh, so, uh, but Marcellus took back two boxes very similar to this to his home, and Cicero writes later about visiting uh, General Marcellus's grandson in his home and seeing boxes like this. Okay. So there's, in the literature, there's descriptions of it, but this is the only one we have in evidence. In evidence. Okay. Yeah. If we find something that's uh, embedded not in water to be rusted and so forth, uh, maybe it will be in better shape to understand. Yes. So let's hope archaeology would do something. Yes. Uh, any other questions? I have another question for uh, uh, Todd uh, regarding the heliocentric, uh, 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 geocentric. Mm -hmm. Does this tell us anything about their beliefs in that? Uh, because I, I read one article about how ancient Greeks uh, believed in a really heliocentric, and for mm -hmm. some reason uh, this knowledge was lost and then discovered by Copernicus and others. And this. Any? What they could see when they changed into the lunar eclipses, or sorry, the, the, well, yeah, the lunar eclipses, when they could see the Earth's shadow moving across the moon, they could see it was round. And they started putting together that, okay, we live on a round planet. And then they started realizing the rotation of what was happening with the planets. Um, it's, it's quite likely that they, they might have thought it was heliocentric. Although, if you look at some of their, if you look at this device, actually, this does still kind of put Earth at the center and they said everything's going around it. So they might have been right on the cusp of that. Can we attribute this to the fact that sometimes, even today, in the 21st century, we, we say that the sun is rising and setting, while uh, we know that it's not the truth. We, it's, right. we just, for everyday use, we say it is rising, but it's not. Yes. Could it be that? Oh, yeah, I, I think absolutely, yes. Any other questions? Otherwise, we will give him another round of, round of applause. And okay. thank, you. thank you. Stage a little bit. Uh, again, I'm following up on uh, Kathy's presentation, which was uh, fantastic. So I am going to um, start out with a prayer. Um, and the prayer is this. This is from the Homeric Hymns. It's a prayer to the god Hephaestus. That's the picture over on the right. Hephaestus was the Greek god of craftsmanship and technology. And uh, this was a prayer that um, craftsmen would say. It's basically talking about how technology has, they felt, the Greeks felt that technology has lifted them up. As they say here, uh, we used to dwell in, in caves like wild beasts. Now we've learned the crafts from Hephaestus. Uh, it's making our life good. I also want to start out with um, sort of setting the stage here. Um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about um, how we think about the ancient Greeks and their technology. And when I get into the who's who, we'll discuss uh, two or three of the inventors. And then the individual inventions I'll be talking about are listed here. The one at the bottom, analog computer, is the one I will focus the most on because this is just an amazing invention. Uh, if we had not discovered it, uh, people probably would not believe that they actually could have done this type of technology. So it'll be very, um, I hope, interesting to get into discussing that. So through ancient lenses, here on the left, we have our ancestors, Cro-Magnon Man, about 35,000 years ago. On the right, we have today's modern man looking very contemplative. And I'm bringing this up because uh, when I was taking a uh, Today, he's talking with a different hat, and that is that of his background in technology. And um, we're anxiously awaiting some comments and uh, information from Todd Bruns. Thank you, Dr. Lanham. OK, um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I don't know if we're running on continuous video or not, um, so hopefully they'll understand this comment. But I don't know if I can really um, follow up on aphrodisiacs. But um, <laughs> hopefully, um, you will find this presentation interesting uh, anyway. I'm going to talk about ancient Greek technology. And uh, this is a wide area, so I'm going to focus on particular inventions and uh, talk about a couple of different inventors. And I'm going to kind of set this. Uh, 
here is uh, the keep. Uh. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, nobody can introduce him better than our dean of the library. Well, in the continuation here of the, the Symposium on Ancient Greece, we're honored to have with us the um, Institutional Repository Librarian here at Booth Library, who is uh, in charge of the efforts uh, for the KEEP uh, uh, for Eastern Illinois University. A course called Global Technology. It was talk, taught by a certain uh, Dr. Wafiq Wabi. And, <laughs> and that's when I first met Dr. Wabi. And we read a very interesting article by Jared Diamond called The Great Leap Forward. And Jared Diamond talked about how 35,000 years ago, our larynxes changed so that we could have complex speech. And people started living longer. Those two things made a big difference in terms of all of a sudden, we started doing art, we started doing technology, we really did this great leap forward. This is important thinking about the ancient Greeks because I think we tend to think about previous generations, previous societies were not quite as smart as we are. They didn't quite have the technology we did. Actually, they were 35,000.